I'm Tristan Roberts. I'm at the intersection of biology and cryptography. And I'm Matt Davis. I am a biohacker and co-founder of Mini Circle Incorporated with Walter Patterson. Howdy. And I'm Walter. I'm a researcher at uh, Mini Circle. And uh, well, we're about to, I guess, go into the thing we've been working on for a, a little bit now, or at least a topic which is near and dear to our heart. Yeah, thank you guys for joining us. And then, uh, Steve, do you mind introducing yourself really quickly, too? Thanks, Steve. Just joined. Hey, guys. Hey, Steve. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm Steve Finkbeiner. I'm working with, uh, with Mac Walter and Tristan on the Mini Circle project. Uh, you want like some background or something? Tell us about your experience. Yes. Oh yeah. So I uh, I have a PhD in molecular pharmacology, which is just a fancy way of saying I'm a molecular biologist. Uh, I did postdoc at NIH, and then another postdoc at St. Jude, and now I'm uh, I'm working with uh, startups like Mac and Walter and Tristan. Uh, on biology ideas, so that's my that's my background. Very cool. Biology ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So we can uh, go ahead and get started. Um, if you guys have any questions, we're gonna try and keep this really casual. So feel free to jump in at any point, whether it's about the science or kind of what uh, Tristan and the Mini Circle guys are trying to do. So yeah, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat, or feel free to ask out loud. So yeah, take it away, guys. All right, thank you. So we've all heard the term plasmids, but we're going to be talking about a particular type of plasmid today. Uh, plasmids are circular pieces of DNA that prokaryotes use to transmit information horizontally. Uh, but many circles are the same basic technology, however, they've been designed to remove the bacterial components of the plasmid. So this diagram shows how a parental plasmid, which has both um, some bacterial components like the ORI, um, and as well as the transgene, which is what we want, that's the actual payload, that's what we're hoping to teach the cells how to produce. Um, there's a way of slicing it so that the, the transgene and, and a human promoter comes off um, on one, and the bacterial backbone comes off into another plasmid. Yeah, and in this chart, the, the origin and the canamycin resistance gene is also on there as part of the backbone. This was just a better diagram than what they had on the uh, great, great article. Great diagram. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna go through the abstract quickly, and then each of the color coding, there's gonna be slides pertaining to each of these colors. So you might wanna, you feel free to ask questions at any point, but you can also just wait until we get to that color if you, if you have a specific question for that color. So I guess I'm gonna dig down into this, boys. Go ahead. Uh, now we're going to go through this all together. The loss of transgene expression. So actually, seeing the protein that's that the transgene, the, this gene we're introducing into the cell, this foreign bit of DNA, uh, the protein that express. We've seen a loss of transgene expression, which has been a major obstacle for non-viral vectors. So things like regular plasmids um, for the treatment of human diseases. So all that's saying is transgenes when they're done in plasmids don't stick around a long time and we're about to learn in the next sentence why that is and it's because of something called uh transcriptional slicing or what's also sometimes called in the literature transgene slicing you can think about this as if you had a little loop of dna it's actually getting sliced up particularly around the origin of replication for the bacterial bit so that origin of replication for the bacteria is a little bit of a target when it comes to transgene slicing. 
So that will target uh, certain enzymes to actually like chop it up in the same way you would see, uh, for example, uh, similar wet mechanisms in like things like CRISPR. It's a foreign bit of DNA and it's being targeted for destruction. And so you can't reliably use it to have long-term transgene expression. Um, so as we'll continue, what they did is they used this one enzyme called uh, phi C31 integrase. And so what this little guy does is we saw in the diagram before, it has two little sites on that plasmid. Now these sites essentially come together to form a new site producing two kind of baby or daughter plasmids. One of them being a mini circle and one of them being a regular old plasmid. Now I distinction the plasmid of whether it has the origin of replication. So if it has that origin of replication, it's a plasmid because a bacteria can make it, where the mini circle does not have the origin of replication. And as we know previously, as they've just discussed, that transgene slicing occurs typically with either uh, canamycin, ampicillin, or origin of replications. So in that way, you're getting rid of the part that actually will cause it to be sliced up. And then they determine with the, in the next sentence, uh, with two different antibody, uh, with two not antibodies, but with two different proteins, uh, the factor eight, human factor eight, uh, or nine, forgive me, and uh, alpha trypsin. And so they compared that, and they did this in mice liver. So they took their little mice's, they put it into the liver. So got them on the little backs, stuck them in it, um, and then they just compared the two. And so what they found was over the course of days and weeks that, now keep in mind, if you were to do plasmids in vitro, uh, sometimes you'll get a couple days, sometimes you might get a week, but depending on how you set up your construct, but in all that I've ever seen, they tend to be... <laughs> <laughs> Just keep going, Walter. <laughs> mice? Uh, yeah, mice. Uh, my bad. But they tend to be... Uh, you know, they don't last forever. They don't last as long as things like viruses or other methods, um, such as knock in, knock out. So um, that's what essentially they're saying in this abstract. Any questions thus far? Yeah, so one question I had reading this paper is, um, what's the need to have non-viral vectors? Because I know like adenovirus associated vectors are useful, and, like retroviral vectors. Like what's the clinical outcome that we're looking for here? So in this case, we are looking for both for clinical application as well as non-clinical application, a localized uh, bit of transgene expression within a tissue or within a culture. Um, we're not looking for this to spread far outside the scope of where we put it. Um, now this could be for reasons of targeting certain tissue, or this could be uh, for reasons wanting to find out about a certain cell type or et cetera. And so you wanna have a localized site. Um, as well as just for therapeutic applications, the fact that you don't want it spreading throughout the body. You don't want, uh, you know, if there's a uh, fuck up, you don't wanna have it go into like a cytokine storm. You don't want uh, overexpression of something you can't fix down the uh, line by simply biopsy. When, uh, when viral vectors are used and injected intravenously, they can float many places, and uh, that means you don't know where they all go. And it's very hard to uh, bring in so after they're infused. Go for it, Steve. So the thing that got me really interested in, in this project was uh, uh, the, the idea here, the way I see it, is it's something that's, uh, that's actually done in animal work a fair, a fair amount, and it's called transient transgenesis. And basically, it's of germline editing without, without germline editing. And the, uh, you won't have to do scary viral vectors that could integrate somewhere else that you don't want. Uh, whatever off-target effects there might be, it only lasts as long as the DNA lasts wherever you, wherever you put it. So shoot it up too fast. So I think it's a nice middle ground between 
uh, the stability of shooting antibodies or a protein replacement and gene and, and actual gene therapy where you're doing, doing uh, germline editing. So I just I think it's a cool middle ground that hasn't been really explored until these guys got into it. The henna tattoo of gene therapy. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't know if my cigar. Yeah. yeah, no, that was perfect. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's good. I think that's good. Yeah, that's good imagery. All right, so we've already sort of covered this. There's just, it only lasts for a few days because of the immune system's ability to, to slice it. Um, so th there was a lot of research into plasmids in the 60s and 70s, and then it sort of died down, and then there was a resurgence in the early 2000s. And that's when they started figuring out why the plasmids were getting silenced. Yeah, this paper is from 2003. It's, I think it, it would count as one of the early papers where the word mini circle is used. So, yeah, this is very similar to that first diagram we showed. Now let's and go, yeah, like, we'll we'll go ahead and, the, and break down each of the uh, components, if you'd be so kind. So we're gonna go to A, and we're gonna go to the first construct. Now, I just want y'all, and the easiest way to do this is you see the first little box, the AATTB, that's just the site that it's gonna recombine with, and on the other side, it has the AATP. Okay, so you have B and P on both ends of that top bit. And in between that, you have what is essentially the cassette for the mini circle where you have the transgene. Now the transgene in this case is H-A-A-T, so that box right there. Mm -hmm. And so what we're gonna do is instead of going through all the little bits, all I want you to notice is that H-A-A-T in the next one over, this is the mini circle. Now you only have the transgene uh, that is wanted to be expressed, and then at the bottom there where that ATTB and ATTP recombined, you get a site called ATTR, and the other one is called uh, ATTL for the corresponding one. Um, and so if you notice, the transgene on one side or, or one flanking sides of these little bastards, forgive my language, and the other one corresponds to the other side. So on one side, at the bottom of that first plasmid, you have your uh, alpha C integrase, you have your uh, arabinose induction, the bad, um, you have uh, your ampicillin resistance. And so if you go down to the third plasmid, you'll see that. You see that you'll have like essentially your origin of replication, your essentially bacterial working bits the stuff you need coded in the bacteria to get this selected for, so your ampicillin resistance, your origin of replication, and your phi integrase. And you'll see that in the third plasmid down. Now that is the daughter plasmid, and the mini circle is correspondent to the second plasmid. And we can see that the HAAT is conserved within that second plasmid, while the bacteria stuff is conserved within the third plasmid. And if we go over to B, this is showing just how they did the second uh, with the uh, human factor nine uh, as the transgene. And that's all they're showing there. They're not showing the products of that. They're just showing that that's the configuration they did for the human factor nine one. And so the differences between that are essentially, I believe they have a, a different uh, promoter. Um, but other than that, um, it's uh, the exact same thing going on in both systems. All right, uh, so just to, to sum, we're still using bacteria to produce these things, and that's why we still need some of these bacterial components, but then we're, they figure out a way of removing that in the second step. Is there any other questions before we move to the next uh, part of this figure? I just uh, yes, to maybe out. I had uh, one question. Yeah. Sure, was, uh, why 
do you actually uh, need the integrase and why don't you use, for instance, restrictions enzymes next to the, um, to the expression cassette? Why wouldn't you use this, for instance? So this is a good question. Um, and so the reason you would do this is for in terms of now you could use in, you could use uh, uh, restriction enzymes. You technically can. Uh, but the issue is you'll have to go back with ligases and you'll have to go back with other bits in order to fix up the DNA after it's been cut. And so if you're looking at production amounts, uh, keep in mind, uh, either if you're using thigh integrase or if you're using uh, flip integrase or uh, the cree lock system to make a mini circle. There's multiple different enzymes you can use to make these mini circles, but if you use a restriction enzyme, you uh, have to go back with ligase. And in order for like a nice industrial production of it, like you would want for a therapeutic, it would be much. It would be a rate limiting step in how much you could make, rather than just growing up E. coli and then triggering with arabinose. Does that make? Sense? Okay, yes, I see. Well, yes, kind of. Yeah, I was just wondering because now you still have the, the leaky promoter of the, the Phi C31, but I don't know how it compares to uh, having to use the light gaze afterwards. So, so you think, say it's. I think you're misunderstanding. The Phi, uh, the, the phi C integrase is removed with the bacterial bits in this paper, and that is conserved within the bacterial portion. Whereas, yeah, but if you um, continue, and so but if the let, let's say the promoter the promoter is kind of leaky, then um, you get that the phi C three integrase is already active, but then it can't um, all the bacterial parts get lost, and then then it can't be replicated anymore, so you get loss. Of yeah, for the production of your plasmid, but you say it's this is less than if you or less costly than if you would add ligase afterwards. Yes. Um, now okay. the reason that is is you can keep this maintained relatively because of the selection marker. You can get this relatively largely maintained even up in like large like three hundred liter vats. Okay. Um, and so at that point, it's not really a thing of uh, you're worried about uh, whether it's going to trigger at the wrong time. You're actually more or less worried that you're actually just going to lose the selection mark um, in terms of just what you're going to get, just in terms of practicality. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, however, that is, a, uh, that is a very good point. And so along, you will start seeing, particularly towards later uh, bit growth phase, Phase, you might start seeing like bits of DNA if you're doing like gel runs while the system's going through you will see a little bit of activity with that leaky promoter um, but in all honesty uh, bad and RBC are not that bad of leaky promoters they're fairly so good about tricks so you will see a little bit of it during um, production however once you actually do induce with the Robinos uh, you do see like a much larger uh, bit. You end up about 20% of all plasmid being converted. But just because the scale and the easiness of being able to make up 100 liter vat, it's fairly like uh, robust in terms of the amount you get. Okay, thank you. Does that make any sense? How do you, once, once you have your uh, mini circle ready to be used within an organism, can you guys kind of walk through the steps uh, where you can confirm that it was made in the way that you think it was, that the sequence is essentially what you want to inject? So there's a couple different sites. So keep in mind, and, uh, and this goes to what type of enzyme you're using. Keep in mind, you can use FLP sites, you can use, um, uh, integrase sites, you can use Lox Cree. So if you look at, the, if we go back uh, one more real quick. Uh, How far? One, no, down. This one? There we go. So the ATTR, that is a sequence you would want to be looking for because that would confirm recombination. Um, that's what you're looking for. Now in the case of like uh, Lox, you're looking for a Lox P site. 
So let's say you're recombining 66 and 71. You'll see a LOX P site. If you're doing flip, you'll find another site. And you're looking for a successful sites of recombination uh, in sequencing. You, know, you can do Sanger, you can do solid state. Um, but the big thing is, is looking for those sites to make sure that this is not a plasma, but rather a mini circle. Thank you. All right, shall we? So what's going on in these uh, these figures, Walter? So um, if you see, and this 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 comes back to what that gentleman earlier was saying. Um, if you can see at the time of induction, and keep in mind this is a reversible reaction. So this is going back and forth all the time, okay? So, but you can still see if we look at the ratio of production, uh, it will increase from uh, to about twenty percent of total volume or to total mass of that plasmid. About twenty percent will be converted into a mini circle and a parent and a daughter plasmid. That's just what we're going to use. So there's a mini circle and there's a daughter plasmid from a parent plasmid just to make things simple. And you can see what they've done is they've induced the integrase, and then they're looking over a couple minutes, and then they're saying, okay, this is when we get that nice 20% amount. And then it'll go back and forth between 20% and more 20%. And this is kind of the same across a lot of different mini circle systems. So if you look at uh, Cree, you get the same thing if you look at FLP. You also get the same thing, about 20%, sometimes more, sometimes less, dependent on a few different uh, factors, including uh, bacterial health, strain, and also just operating condition as well as induction amounts. And so if we look at the next one, we can see the ratio of the mini circle, uh, so in figure D, versus the time of induced. And so what they determined in the paper is about two hours after induction, you're going to plateau, and that is the point in which you should harvest. So let's say if I'm growing up, I have a chain, I have a seed train, and I'm growing this up from a little shake flask all the way to a 300 liter reactor. After induction of the 300 liter reactor, I wanna harvest my bacterial shit, forgive my language, uh, after about two hours. OK, and we can see that based on the actual uh, bits we get now. Um, does that make any sense of what they're doing here in terms of just like optimizing when they're harvesting uh, from their bacteria? So, yeah, just to recap, the, the reaction is going back and forth between the parent and these two. Yeah. Children. So and they're 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 yeah. forming together and they're coming apart and sometimes some of them will form together again, but it's doing it in a way that like you're gonna get twenty percent over here and another eighty some percent over here, and that's just the way it does. Um, now that sounds like there's a lot of waste and there is technically a lot of waste, but keep in mind because you don't have a rate limiting step, uh, like with uh, restriction enzymes. So if I had, if I just harvested a bunch of uh, plasmids and I wanted to like uh, form them back up with subcloning, I would have to go back through and use another enzyme called uh, ligase to make sure everyone's like uh, good in everyone's order. Um, just kind of sewing back up the backbone of the DNA where this method, you do not require that. And also, so, uh, yeah, continue. Not familiar with electrophoresis, all, all these different bands signify different sizes of plasmids that are found in the sample. So the parent plasmid, the mini plasmid, and the mini circle, and some other forms are all found in those different bands. All right, let me know when to move to the next slide, Walter. I think you might be muted. Yep, Walter's muted. Okay, uh, I, think, I think that's the general idea uh, just conveying uh, with this figure. Okay, now let's get to the rats, boys. Um, so, the, the here mice. we have... The mice. Okay, sorry, rodents of some kind. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, I'll actually let y'all boys handle this one if you want. Sure, so we're looking at uh, after the injection of mini circles or just regular plasmid. They're, they're trying to compare the difference. 
and um, how much of the the target protein, which is from a human, it shouldn't be in a rat in a in a mouse. So human alpha one antitrypsin. So uh, this this uh, graph is on a log scale, so you can see how um, there's a big difference. Uh, the circles are are the mini circles, and the triangles are the uh, plasmids. I think. And this is the, the fall off of the, uh, the plasmids expression over, um, days. over days. And here you can see the mini circle seems to keep on trucking. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, alpha one antitrypsin is a protein that is involved with the chewing up process and cleaning up the lungs. It's produced primarily by the liver and circulates through the blood. Um, they also used a very, uh, in my opinion, unusual uh, method of administering the mini circles. They uh, injected it into the hepatic liver uh, artery or vein, hmm. well, the, 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 lar the, the largest uh, blood vessel in the, in the liver. So it was an intravenous transfusion of, I think, 2.3 milliliters, which is on the order of how much blood there is in, in the animal. Holy crap. Um, so normally, small amounts of DNA are completely destroyed very, very quickly in the blood. But when you overwhelm the system, they get a chance to uh, transform. So I don't think they even used a transformation reagent, rather they use this infusion process. All right, any questions before we move on to figure three? Yeah, so um, with that kind of large amount of mini circles, is that representative of something that would be used uh, in humans down the line? Or is this kind of more just showing that the mini circles can have that type of expression um, in theory? So initially, it is unlikely for such infusion practices to be done in humans initially um, without good reason. Uh, it's mostly for a safety factor bit. Um, but what you're likely to see in terms of the first bits of mini circles is actually more localized site injections uh, with transfection reagent. Um, now, uh, the reason that is, like, uh, it's essentially just for a safety factor. Now, if there was a uh, issue you had, um, let's say, and you wanted to use a mini circle for it, uh, where you did want that intravenous injection, um, the other issue you run into is the amount of mini circle required, just because humans are such a large animal. Um, that being said, that it is very much possible that that may one day be used like that to exhibit, for example, let's say you're deficient in a protein that is required for you to live. I have no idea what a good example of that would be off the top of my head. And is so some people are born without the ability to produce it. Right, and so in those cases where you just need, you need a lot of protein and you need it expressing now, or you're going to die. Uh, that would be an example of why you would use that. Now, however, my feeling is what we'll see a lot is uh, more or less small site injections with transfection reagents to increase the efficiency of mini circles, um, just to get them, into the during, get them expressing into the blood serum. And then maybe in a few years down the line, maybe something like that in humans you might start seeing, but I, I have the feeling just because of the amount of resources as well as uh, just possible safety issues, it would be easier to do a site injection rather than like a full infusion of mini circles. I think uh, in the clinical setting, it's not uncommon for people to have, uh, to have uh, long-term high volume transfusions uh, for things like bone marrow transplant, it's typically on the order of liters that you're actually putting back into the patient. Uh, there are entire clinics set up for IV chemotherapy. So I think if, uh, 
if the mini circle team could get good animal data showing that the construct work, uh, I, which I which I think is forthcoming soon, but I, I think it wouldn't be that much of a stretch to to do that in people on that that magnitude of a transformation uh, uh, that volume. I don't think that's asking a lot, actually. Uh, I think if you've ever seen, uh, I saw a blood transfusion once, and I was amazed at the volume that they're actually putting into people when they do that. It's it's basically on the order of a blood transfusion. It's massive, massive volume. Uh, so if it if it works for stem cells, which kind of work on the same timeline, you know, it's kind of hard to get stem cells to engraft. You're really not asking much from the doctors to hook somebody up to an IV for a couple hours while you pump volume, you know, liters of volume into them. And the oh. por the portal vein injection for the liver, I think, is actually great because with most of these things, you see tail vein because it's easy. Uh, but liver for these genes makes sense. And uh, the liver is also kind of like a, a capillary sponge and is a really good trap for, for things. So I think, uh, I think that might be low hanging fruit for a mini circle target is something that needs to be expressed in liver and you shoot it right into the portal vein and it's the liver should just soak it up. It's got a lot of macrophage activity as well for eating things. So you, you would actually get it taken up. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So we're now on to figure three, which is just showing that they they did have evidence that the plasmids did make it into the mouse livers. Do you have anything else to add, Walter? Uh, not really. Um, this one's somewhat self-explanatory. Just it's just reconfirming that like. They uh, went back through and they found the copy number um, in the mice, as well as uh, they did some uh, just generalized, like finding out to make sure that the DNA was still there. So on one side, you're seeing like uh, a copy number per uh, the actual genome of the animal. And the other side, you're actually seeing where they took that, chopped it up, and they're just comparing through. Yeah, I think I think the idea of this figure was to show that the increased expression in the previous figure wasn't due to mini circles increased ability to find its way into cells. So they're saying like the mini circle found its way into cells at a similar rate to the bacterial plasmids, yet the mini circles had much longer prolonged expression. So mm -hmm. that has to do with the, like something about the mini circle, not necessarily how it's able to get into a cell. Gotcha. All right, we'll just uh, go over these really quickly. These are from the results section. To determine if the human AAT expressing mini circle was devoid of bacterial DNA silencing in vivo, we compared the expression profiles of the mini circular DNA with the uncut plasmid. Serum concentrations of human AAT obtained from mice injected with purified expression cassette were more than threefold higher than those of the mice that received two fragment DNA. And it was 20 to 43 fold higher than those that received CC DNA in injection. Uh, and that's after three weeks of, after the DNA infusion. And the mice receiving mini circle DNA produced 10 to 13 fold more serum human AAT than those receiving the purified expression cassette, which was 200 to 560 fold higher than that of the CC DNA group. So I should add that I think there was another condition where they were using non-plasmid DNA. They were using CC DNA, which I think is, is linear, and they were comparing that as well. Is that, uh, CC is closed circular, right? Steve? <laughs> yes, <laughs> Some sorry, DNA. I was muted. Yeah. Yes, it's closed circular. Okay. And here's the funny meme. Yeah, here's here's your here's your halftime meme. Thank you for making it this far. <laughs> All right. Um, some more results. Previously, uh, they demonstrated that circular plasmids remained as an in intact circles in the mouse liver. To establish if mini-circle DNA behaved like other circular plasmids in the mouse liver, we analyzed the molecular structure of the vector DNA by Southern Blot. This is the, that last figure we looked at. And we found multiple bands ranging from 1.6 to 23 kilobytes of the liver DNA samples from the mice infused with mini circle DNA. 
these bands were converted. And when they were cut, it was just the multiple bands represented a single supercoiled DNA molecule or multiple copy aggregates of the main circle. Thus, similar to a circular plasmid, the main circle DNA was maintained as an intact episomal circle in the mouse liver. So I guess the, the summary of what we're saying is that this is like, it's like a, it's plugging right into, well, it's acting as its own independent um, gene source. It's, it's, um, it's still maintaining it, its circular shape, but it's, it's, it, and it's, it's operating using that within the cell. So they essentially, from the previous figures, uh, when they put in these little mini circles, you had your plasma DNA, and what they did is essentially do a restriction digest, made sure all the parts were still there, so they would correspond to the different bands that you would see if you cut it up with a various uh, restriction enzyme. Seeing that those had been maintained and it was still all the same as previously, it was determined that the mini circle had cons uh, conserved its actual sequence and its code and hadn't been chopped up. Does that make any sense? Yep. So one question I had about um, kind of the gene expression of mini circles is I was curious if you guys could walk me through just like um, the transport from the mini circle being injected within the hepatic vein to crossing like the cell membrane to being imported into the, the nucleus itself. Because I assume uh, it's using the transcriptional machinery of the you know eukaryotic cell in the liver. So can it can it just do that through diffusion or does it get picked up by a protein? Um, I'm curious how it gets like across the nuclear membrane. In this case, uh, for what they're doing here, I'm pretty sure it is actually because of a uh, bit on the sequence. I'm going to pull up my paper just to confirm, but I believe it is, uh, there's a certain factor on the sequence that actually like helps it like get into it in this case. And I believe it uh, has to do with a viral sequence on this particular mini circle. However, in others you can do, uh, what's it called? Uh, you can use things like PEI, these kinds of lipofectamine to get it in as well, if you don't have such sequences in there. Um, but I'm pretty sure in this case it is sequence-based. Cool, thank you. I think, uh, I think how this stuff actually works in vivo is still, uh, is still kind of a little bit of uh, black magic that people tend to wrap under the uh, wrap under the, the trendy word of translocation or things like that. Uh, I think there would be really cool experiments to figure that out. Uh, I don't know if anybody for sure knows how, how even uh, like calcium precipitation or PEI actually works, like what is actually happening at the membrane to get this giant molecule across when most eukaryotic cells absolutely hate the idea of taking up DNA of any kind. Uh, but that's not to say it doesn't work. It's just the actual mechanism is not, uh, I don't think it's ever been very well explained to my satisfaction. Aside from electroporation, which I think everyone understands, if you zap at the right voltage, you'll make transient holes and get, get charged molecules across, um, which I think is, uh, you know, if you're, if you're only going for local distribution, electroporation in a whole organism actually might make sense. Uh, it's not a terrible idea. Cool, thanks. Yeah. So now we're sort of in the conclusion, the impact. Our data clearly demonstrated that the mini circle was the most efficient vector form and could express persistent and high levels of trans gene product. But now that we have the technology, what are we going to do with it? Well, some people have genetic disorders and they're lacking the gene to make a protein that the rest of us makes and it kind of sucks for them. So this could potentially be a way of treating them that could last for months at a time instead of having to keep infusing proteins directly. Maybe even years. Maybe even years. Mm -hmm. uh, antibodies is what I'm the most focused on right now, I'm trying to use um, the gene sequences to make uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies that are effective against a large um, amount of the HIV virus types. Uh, 
We're also pursuing folostatin for augmenting muscle growth. Right now, people are prone to inject the protein uh, and then it lasts for a month or two. So this could potentially, in, 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 again, increase the duration of the treatment. And then perhaps we'll start seeing people inject things that aren't made in humans naturally. And uh, that's, is it loading? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. There we go. So uh, yes. that, that I think we're going to start seeing people injecting non-human proteins or DNA to make non-human proteins. And at that point, it becomes a question of well, what is a human anymore? And are those people still human? And there's a whole bunch of fun ethical questions we as a society are going to dive into. When I ask people, random people, if you could genetically modify yourself to be anything, uh, top two answers I get, cat girl and mermaid. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> Next slide, please. So this is just uh, the different antibodies. Some of them we're looking at putting into many circles, a combination. So, so each one doesn't give 100% coverage. But if you combine two or three of them, then you pretty much have 100% coverage. It's very unlikely the virus would be able to evolve against um, two or three of the antibodies. But they don't last that long. So that's part of the problem. We want a, a delivery system that will keep producing it. Yeah, antibody infusions generally last about a month, as this, this shows. Le less than that, really. So the, the top selling drug in the world, Humira, uh, people have to come in and get infused into their blood in pretty large quantities every uh, month or two. And if they have a relapse in making it to the clinic, as may be common with uh, the coronavirus crisis, then they're in danger of the therapy no longer working for them and having a bad reaction the next time around. So in the case of delivering actual antibody protein infusions, a person is be held to the company that is giving the infusions. Uh, they're dependent versus with a gene therapy process. There's a lot more independence because you don't have to show up every month or two for a $4,000 infusion. Rather than relying upon factories filled with prokaryotes to produce the proteins, why not just have your body produce the proteins? That's what, really what it comes down to. That really does uh, get to the point of just the benefit logistically, both for the ideas of, uh, you know, eventual therapeutic use. Uh, if you were to, because we've been, scientists have been making proteins for a long time. Now, whether those last a long time in your blood serum or a very short time, um, in both cases, just because of the reliance of having to go to the doctor to ensure that you're getting the correct dosage, it may be easier, it may be more beneficial, and it may be more, just in terms of logistics, a lot simpler to do a transgene instead of an active protein, which I think is a very good point. Okay, so now we've got all that covered, I can kind of explain why I'm in such a pickle when it comes to curing HIV. So let's say that we, I inject a combination of these mini circle antibodies and for, for six months, the virus doesn't come back. At what point in time have I become cured? So I, I, keep, I keep getting messages from people who say, oh, the second person was cured of HIV. Isn't that so amazing? And I'm like, I know other people who have stayed undetectable. It's more of a, a question of, are there people in white coats who are staking their reputation behind the claim? It's only then that it becomes true in like the, the minds of the, the public. So I like to joke that a group of, of white people uh, together is, is called a prophet. And without that prophet, 
there is no cure. That's why I'm really excited about these emerging uh, Web 3.0 knowledge markets where people will be able to stake their, their currency, their reputation, their whatever behind an idea. And that will hopefully motivate other people to do more investigation rather than us relying upon these uh, existing systems of truth making, like the peer review system and clinical trials, which have become stale. I can also comment on the uh, profit and cure. Goldman Sachs, I think two years ago, uh, did a thorough research investigation into the economics and financials of pharmaceutical production and concluded in almost all instances, it is unprofitable to cure a disease. And uh, the entire point of the pharmaceutical industry is to make lifelong customers out of people. So I, I, I do have hope that it will, that cures will become more and more uh, popular in existence. Uh, they will proliferate because uh, when a disease is cured, the actual value that's produced is the power of the conscious experience and the power of health. Um, that's more valuable than money. Um, yeah, yeah, Raul, how, how do they suffer? Because uh, that is one counter example. They, they, hepatitis was, was cured, but, but yeah, what happened that you think that they, what feedback they had? Oh, the stock price. Oh. I, I missed this question. Can we? He, he uh, asked, well, he commented that um, Gilead suffered after they cured hepatitis. Gilead. Oh, investors pulled money out. I, I mean, I don't know if there is a causal connection. I, I wasn't there. Can you confirm? Uh, are you in Gilead or an investor? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons why a stock price can, can go up and down. Again, I, I have a question really quick. Okay. Um, thanks, thanks for the uh, comment, Raul. Good real world example, potentially. I think what you guys are doing is really admirable. It brings a lot of attention to something that could have this sort of huge societal impact in the future. I wonder if you can kind of touch on how, like in general, clinical studies are important because it's really hard to tell if something works or not. For instance, <laughs> SSRIs versus placebos. Like you need like huge numbers in order to kind of see an effect size. Um, I wonder, like, how do you guys see what you guys are trying to bring to the marketplace? Transition from like these n equals one studies into kind of bigger randomized controlled trials where the people in the white coat can then you know rely on it and spread the word. Yeah, as far as I can tell, there's a standard vehicle pipeline where you go from a human cell culture study to a mouse study to possibly a more complex animal and uh, then uh, whatever approval agency in your jurisdiction may approve uh, you to do a legally sanctioned human clinical trial. Um, there are a lot of jurisdictions in the world. Uh, in the case of some diseases like coronavirus, there's no adequate animal model. So uh, if you've done it in a human cell, it would actually make sense to just do it in a human afterwards if enough people can get together and decide that uh, you would not be uh, counted by the legal system as complicit in murder or, or some other type of legal liability. Basically, the clinical trial system and the regulatory apparatus is set up in order to kind of front the cost of legal liability and uh, say that, okay, the, this is a sanctioned trial and if something does happen to these people, then uh, um, the company that is responsible uh, is, uh, you know, lifted of liability. So very interesting situation, especially uh, Going further into the ethics of clinical trials, the whole concept of having informed consent. Uh, I think in a lot of cases, the most informed consent is actually the scientists themselves who have designed the thing, uh, testing it on themselves. In the case of large scale clinical trials, you're actually guaranteed not to have informed consent, especially with a new technology 
um, but also with the small molecule that was created by a system that your average person with diabetes has nothing that knows nothing about. Um, so I could go on about clinical trials. Uh, the history of clinical trials, clinical trials, the whole the whole ethical background was set up allegedly because of the Nuremberg trials and all of these other things that government institutions typically did to uh, exploited populations, whether it be uh, a race, uh, people in Nicaragua, prisoners. And uh, so be because of those actions that were done in wholesale by governments themselves, who are now the regulatory bodies, um, we have this clinical trial infrastructure that is allegedly uh, ethical. Um, also, every book I've read on how to design a clinical trial, in the introduction, the author says, although clinical trials are the gold standard of you know, scientifically determining if something works in, in humans, uh, they're actually really, really terrible because of all these reasons. And in a lot of cases, they're completely irrelevant, but we have to do them because that's the general rule. It's almost like with coronavirus, you know, uh, people in laboratories around the world are kicked out of their own laboratories. I was just at UCLA in the immunology department, and they told me they are going on lockdown. This is one of the most advanced biochemistry laboratories in the world, and they're getting kicked out of their lab. That's insane. Um, there should be... Uh, understood uh, you know, separate enclaves or uh, unique circumstances. And I think gene therapy is an example of, in general, a pretty unique circumstance. So I, like uh, go ahead, Steve. I have a more hopeful view about clinical trials. I think as the cost of sequencing, I think as the cost of sequencing comes down and uh, physicians are actually given the tools to interpret the data for themselves. Uh, the, the idea of a monolithic corporate or government funded clinical trial is going to go away. A lot of this, a lot of this stuff is really, uh, this is going to sound horrible, but it's really the doctors absolving themselves of responsibility for the patient and asking corporations or government to take that responsibility from them. But they've done it because, because for the last 30 years, uh, healthcare has become so overwhelmingly complicated that one single person can't learn all of it anymore. And so you see that in specialization. Uh, you know, doctors go to medical school and they immediately want to specialize. We have a shortage of general practitioners in the United States, especially. Uh, but what I see happening, my background in industry is in clinical diagnostics. And what I see is the physicians are starting to clamor for precision medicine and individualized treatment. And if you give them the tools, the doctors have no problem telling the government to get lost. They want to, they want to be doctors. They want to actually help people, but you need radical transformation and technology like what mini circle is trying to do to give them the tools to actually do what they need to do. Uh, a doctor is not going to, a doctor is not going to operate a CRISPR experiment, but if you give them a tube of plasmid, they can inject it into a patient and monitor it. Doctors are smart, but you have to give them the tools to actually do the job and you have to train them what an end of one trial actually is and how to do it. So I think it's going to be easier to change the minds of the doctors with evidence than it is to change the minds of the government with evidence. The, the doctors actually want things to change. And I think they're an important audience in this that you know, I, I don't see being talked about. Yeah. Yeah. But they, they, they're, 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 yeah, they're actually our allies in all this. That you know, I think we're really seeing that with the epidemic right now. The doctors are the ones running the show in the hospital, and they all magically just woke up and realized that the bloated salaries of the executives were completely worthless. So now is the you know one of the good things that's going to come out of this epidemic is people are going to realize you know again how important the person-to-person -person interaction is in healthcare and how uh, an intelligent doctor that understands the science can actually reach out to one person and change things. It's up to us as the scientists to give them the tools to actually do that. And I, I think that's... Goal. Yeah, our goal as yeah. a company now in terms of moving towards a clinical trial is, is to develop a relationship personally with the doctor or a few doctors who after seeing 
animal trials are willing to use it as compassionate use or uh, you know with, with a small number of patients to begin with well another you know another example and it kind of you know as, as we go through this conversation it's kind of interesting how aligned they are I didn't realize how aligned they were until I started talking to you guys during this conversation but there there are doctors who have their own practice that bought the machinery to purify mesenchymal stem cells from fat mm -hmm. and they're injecting those stem cells into into people's knees to try to cure them of whatever's going on with their the cartilage in their knees okay yeah and so the doctors the doctors realized hey i am a doctor and i can take a person's body part and put it back into them and nobody can tell me i can't do that and i think there's a way i think there's a way to to give them those those kinds of tools they need to be taught what that is and so you know that's i think mini circles is actually perfect for that because the doctor is not responsible for editing the germline of that person, right? And they're also not responsible for injecting what might be an acutely toxic uh, protein or antibody. Mm -hmm. if they are, they, they have if they had the tool and they could do it, you know, they would they would be able to. It would just be another uh, another arrow in their quiver to use. Yeah, um, and, and actually, it would it would be a lot easier to do yeah. that mesenchymal right. extraction and you know, right. purification and reinjection. But yeah, something's got to give. The pharmaceutical crisis is happening. It's becoming more and more expensive to develop new treatments, and it's reaching the point where nothing really novel is being done. They're just tweaking existing molecules, making a new patent, and and selling it as something innovative. So I, I'm optimistic that that molecule crowdfunding, crypto token, something will allow us to build. Um, a shared mission between the pharmaceutical companies and the academics and the doctors and the patients. Everybody has a stake in it rather than just one group that's trying to extract maximal profit. So I'm optimistic too, but it's it's probably gonna have to get worse before it gets better. Oh, it's getting worse. <laughs> oh, it's definitely getting worse. <laughs> one more question I had for you guys, and specifically for you, Steve, is talking about like uh, these sort of N equals one studies, like I think there actually can be really powerful evidence that will build up like once you have a bunch of them, given mm -hmm. like a, a one individual therapy. Do you all have any um, thoughts on like how you can essentially share the data that results from these N equals one studies in like a open way? So that way anyone can kind of see the aggregated data and uh, the effectiveness that's coming out of any one treatment. Uh... I mean, that's so. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm not much of a programmer. I mean, that seems like it's over my head as a biologist right now. Uh, but that the, you know, the dream is that every general practitioner or every specialist is collecting as much phenotype data on their individual patients as possible, and that goes somewhere, you know. And where where it goes to be looked at by humans or an AI, I don't know, but. There's so much phenotype data that's just going out the window in clinics right now that we could use, and sequencing is so cheap that you know we're we're essentially wasting all that genotype phenotype connection. Uh, I know that NIH has tried to get into that by uh, you know this all of us uh, sequencing program that they have. Uh, anybody who works in clinical diagnostics uses a Thousand Genomes Project every day, which is kind of a small version of that where. You, you know, you have a web browser that lets you see all this variation so you can figure out, you know, how to design your assay to try to capture that. So it's it's creeping in around the edges. Um, I think at some point someone's going to make, you know, what I, what I tell everyone in every space is you, our job is to make nature easy for the doctors because they don't have time to, to know things as in depth as we do. And we have to give them better screwdrivers and better hammers so they can act quickly and save lives. Uh, so I think what you're asking is essentially a tool development question. Is there is there a way we can give them uh, an app or a laptop based way to where when they're taking a history, uh, it is somehow, uh, you know, with respect for privacy, somehow uh, can we can we marry the phoenix? Genotype data in a in a clinical history with genotype data from sequencing, and if you had enough of those, everything would be a clinical trial, and that's what healthcare should be. All of it should be a clinical trial. 
all of that data should be available for everyone to look at. Uh, is that actually going to happen? I don't know. Probably well, not because somebody's going to try to figure out a profit off of it. You know, uh, Sweden is a good example of a company of a uh, country that's been doing something like that for a while. They've they've been gathering lots of different types of genetic and blood data from every person and uh, putting them all in a single database for the benefit of the Swedish people. Um, yeah. There's some and there's a lot of really interesting research that was produced, although it may only have uh, most most of its value for Sweden. That's that's okay because they did the work, right? But then you've got the counter example with these guys. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, but uh, when I was a graduate student, so we're talking a long time ago, there was a guy that uh, essentially tried to sequence everyone in Iceland, and then tried to patent it. You know, he tried to keep all the data for himself, and you know, Icelanders aren't going to tolerate that kind of crap. But it was it was tempted. Or you look at Twenty Three and Me, which just sold. Uh, uh -huh data agreement to, you know, GlaxoSmithKline for billions of dollars. So, you know, every, everyone that I've ever talked to about setting up a genotyping lab or a sequencing lab, it's, it has always been a stealth data play where mm -hmm. you are, where you are essentially trapping like the data. Media. Yeah. 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 It's every, everyone wants to be the Facebook of DNA and it's really, it's really horrifying. Uh, but that's that's the reality that we live in. And to end on a hopeful note. Any other? Any... <laughs> yeah, let's, yeah, let's end on something. You start making uh, these, you start with n equals one, and then you add a few people, and it's more of a, a rolling uh, consensus rather than this like phase one, phase two, phase three approval. Like there needs to. I, it doesn't scale. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not, it's too brittle. It's, and I, I think that using crypto, we have the means to, to be able to look at the data and make informed decisions. You're on a research chemical site. You can see that these people's accounts are tied to seemingly real people and they're giving real feedback as to whether or not it worked. And then you can make an informed decision, which is really what we're after at the end of the day. So. I, I'm optimistic. All right, it, should, you want to take it away, Patrick? Any more? There's no more questions. So before we close off, thank you guys for sharing. That was fascinating. Um, yeah. Does Does anyone else have any questions? If anything pops up, you know, feel free to post it on the research hub discussion, and uh, we'll try and get some. Well, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting me, guys. Thanks, it was guys. fun. It was great. Thank you. Super Thanks. cool. Thank you, Steve. Peace.